Well, to borrow from Lady Carolyn Lamb, Jesus was mad, bad and dangerous to know. He was bad because he repeatedly and defiantly broke one of the key laws at the heart of the Ten Commandments, a law that was a point of national pride that defined them as a people and set them apart from the rest of the world, the Sabbath day. No other people on earth were so dogged about taking a day off a week. It had become such a key point in national life that only a few decades before, Jewish soldiers died at the hands of their enemies rather than fight on the Sabbath day. Now here was Jesus seemingly chucking out the law. Jesus was bad because he was clearly just an uneducated, bushweak handyman, a lawbreaker. How could this man be from God? Why would God give miraculous powers to this bloke who breaks the law and leads others to do the same and teaches them to do it, who parties with enemies of the state and prostitutes? Why would God give him the power to heal and to cast out demons? He was more like a son of anarchy than a son of God. The Pharisees believed Jesus was such a threat to the nation that they did the unthinkable they began working with the Herodians of all people to bring him down. The Herodians were a political party that supported the false King Herod and the Pharisees saw them as traitors, but here they were conspiring with them to destroy Jesus. That would be like the Liberal and National Party teaming up in coalition to run the country. Or probably more extremely, like One Nation and the Greens getting together to run the country. It's unthinkable, isn't it? But here they are. The Pharisees logically concluded that Jesus must be in league with the chief of demons, Beelzebul, given the extraordinary nature of the events they had witnessed. Jesus poured petrol on that fire by pointing out the illogical nature of their arguments. And with a little story about himself being like a thief doing an ag burg on Satan's house to steal all his best stuff. Jesus was seen as mad because all of this ministry stuff had clearly gone to his head to the point where he was acting as though he was the Messiah, the true King of Israel. His family felt like he must have blown a head gasket if he's trying to reboot the nation around himself because that's the whole point of the exercise when he clears off to the mountains and calls 12 apostles. Think back. God, Moses, Mount Sinai, 12 tribes of Israel. No per Jewish person could miss the point of what he's doing. Jesus, mountain, Israelites gathered around, 12 apostles. Jesus is daring to say that the nation needs to be rebuilt from scratch around him. Who does he think he is? He must be nuts, right? So his family thought he had cracked and they came running with a straitjacket to cart him away. So what's this gospel got to do with us today? Our world is ever keen to dismiss Jesus as mad, bad or dangerous to know. You don't make someone's name a household swear word unless you believe that they are a direct threat to your dearly held way of life. It's been nearly 10 years now since Christian religious education and overt Christian chaplaincy were driven out of public schools as bad for young minds and even crazy. Jesus and his church are steadily being pushed out of the public sphere in Western civilization. So if they called him mad, bad and dangerous to know, then why do we think we will dodge the bullet? The communists understand how dangerous Jesus is and they try to snuff out any speech about him and kill the people who follow him or lock them up in prison, intimidate them and threaten their families. Other regimes and religions understand how mad and bad and dangerous Jesus is. Islam, Hinduism. Why would we need an organisation like the Barnabas Fund 
if Jesus and his people weren't a direct threat to people's way of life. And there's a petition you can sign at the back there later. In the West, though, we are still surprised as the church that people treat us as though we're crazy, as though we're evil, as though we're dangerous. But maybe if we aren't being labelled like that, maybe we just aren't being Jesus-y enough in our ministry and life. There's still something going on in churches across the West and across the globe, though. Something good, something utterly compelling that draws the crowds and makes a positive difference in the lives of billions of people, despite our own corruption, despite our own dorkiness and shooting ourselves in the back multiple times, and despite the charges laid against Jesus. So be encouraged. Despite his reputation, Jesus still pulls the crowd, even here in Marupna, even earlier than it should on a Sunday morning. Jesus makes a pronouncement in the middle of our chapter today about what we've come to call the unforgivable sin. I've met so many people over the years, they're like, oh, watch out, I, I don't know if I've just committed the unforgivable sin. They're being borderline superstitious about it, and unnecessarily so. Because it's not about God slamming the door in people's faces, looking to zap them for the slightest infraction or breach of etiquette. It's the other way around. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians just could not accept that this backwards law-breaking miracle worker and crowd-wowing teacher was doing the things he did in the power of the God of Israel and with his blessing. It was easier for them to condemn him and write him off rather than take a good look at the evidence and change their lives to repent and believe the good news. They had closed minds and closed hearts to the sneaky, surprising ways the God of Israel could work. Just as you couldn't see a moonwalking bear for all the basketball passes last week on the video that Carly showed, these groups could not see the King of Israel for all of the counting of his perceived transgressions. Although you would think they'd be able to see clearly, given how fastidious they were about searching the scriptures, given the backstory of how God worked through all kinds of random people, male models, cowards, prostitutes, dummies, donkeys, farmers, burning bushes, bushies, and all the rest. Through condemnation, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Herodians had cut them off from sharing the life of the age to come. They'd cut themselves off. Even down to this day, people cut themselves off from the life-giving power of the age to come because they write God off. I oh, can't, won't, shouldn't work like that around here. Sometimes it emerges as the Christian saying that miracles don't happen today or that the Holy Spirit doesn't act in power through his people today, through miracles of healing, through exorcisms and prophecies and words of knowledge and wisdom, through acts of extraordinary faith and through words of life and through the speaking of tongues. None of that can happen today, can it? People cut themselves off from God's power and life by hiding behind a bluntly material view of the world which they claim to be science. You know, if it's not real and I can't touch it and test it, um, I won't believe it. God can't act miraculously in their estimation. He can't exist because I can't put him in a test tube or quantify him through empirical methods. So they dismiss, dismiss Christians and Jesus as simply crazy or dangerous to themselves and young minds and to the good order of society. Such people have never been condemned 
by God or shut out by him, they've slammed the door in his face. Look at the scribes that day. They stared God in the face in human form and claimed that he was in league with the chief of demons. God broke into this world in human form like a thief in the night, risking it all against the strong man, doing an agberg to steal his greatest treasure, you. Satan doesn't want to let you go. But Jesus broke in and has been steadily looting his house for 2,000 years. Have you been stolen yet? Has Jesus stolen your heart and mind? What else might this say to us today? Well, there's something blunt, blunt said about family and it is scandalous. As scandalous as forgiving sins or healing the sick on the Sabbath. In Jesus' day, family was much more important than it is in our society. They lived together as extended families. They, generation after generation, sometimes in the very same house or in the very same location, in the same town and worked in the same businesses together generation after generation after generation. I don't think we can understand or fathom the kind of social glue that forms between people and the mutual obligations. It's incredibly strong as a family life. So with his mum and his brothers outside, it was a pretty big deal for Jesus to say that this motley crew surrounding him in his house was his actual family now. Enemies of the state like tax collectors, right-wing extremists, fishermen, blokes so low on the ladder of life that we don't know what they did with their days before Jesus met them prostitutes and low down dirty sinners these people he was saying are his family his mother and his sisters and his brothers because they did the will of God by responding to him that's pretty full on small town Australia is still very similar to Jesus own day Family, blood, township are everything to most people living in the Diocese of Bendigo. So Jesus' words cut to the heart. And for Aboriginal families, it's a similar deal to Jesus' day. Families, tribes, nations, ancestors, land and the continuous occupation of it are integral to identity. Yet Jesus doesn't care about any of that. Not one bit. Jesus doesn't care for our definition of family, then or now, white or black. Jesus' family is drawn from every walk of life, from everywhere and from every time across the world. There's only one thing that makes you Jesus' family, that you too do God's will by responding to him and become one of those who forgive sins loves enemies, denies themselves, takes up their cross and follow him. Is that me? For those of us who too often put family commitments, family life and family allegiance before our allegiance to Jesus, these are hard words to hear. Yet I know that there's many folks amongst us whose family of origin was a complete train wreck and perhaps even rejected them, weren't capable of loving them. These are words of life. Our saviour, the king and ruler of the universe, is my brother, and I have a true everlasting family that can never be taken away from me. We've got some real tensions in our national life at the moment. Some, but not all, of the descendants of the colonists, most of us gathered here today, I wager, believe that um, 
those tensions can only be resolved by giving preferential treatment to minorities that have been dealt with unjustly in the past. That's only some folks. I'm saying that we're all descendants from colonists pretty well, but some of us believe those tensions can only be resolved by giving preferential treatment to minorities that have been dealt with unjustly. Some, but not all of the descendants of colonists believe that those tensions in national life can only be resolved by dismissing folks' pain over perceived injustices, dismissing that stuff out of hand, get over it and get on. Some but not all Aboriginal people believe the nation can only be revitalised by voices to parliament, treaties, financial reparations and much more direct control over public affairs and land. We must never forget that Jesus was a member of a defeated, colonised people. Many of his fellow Jews believed the only future for their country was to take up arms and drive the Roman colonisers out by blood and sword. Yet Jesus insisted that all of life must orient itself to him, from the humble family unit to the life of the nation. So it's only in him and taking their cues from him that his nation would have a future and, would, and that the world would have a future. And he called people not to take up arms, but to take up their cross and follow him through the gates of death to everlasting life, to love your enemies and to do good, to, good um, to those who hate you and to bless those who curse you. Family is redefined as being those who do the will of God regardless of their background, as a tax collector, a prostitute, a leper, a formerly demonised person or whoever. And the borders of the empire of God would in a few short years expand to include the Ethiopian, the African at large, then the Greeks, the Macedonians, the Asians, and yes, at last, even the evil Romans. Those people become Jesus' mother and sisters and brothers. The new nation under him as king. There is only one way forward for our country of Australia, and that is to take up our cross and follow Jesus, every last one of us. The Pharisees and the Herodians, they were wrong about Jesus. He wasn't evil. He wasn't bad. Jesus' birth family were wrong. He wasn't mad or cracked. But together, they were all right about him. He's dangerous. Dangerous to a world too easily ruled by Satan that would keep us in prisons of blind nationalism or culture. Prisons that would keep us within narrowly defined legalistic views of religion. Keep us in prisons that would set limits on what is actually possible in this universe. That would keep us in the prison of strict tribalism and family life. That would see Jesus carted away and locked up for our own supposed safety and good. Jesus has broken into this prison called earth, sucker punched Satan, died on the cross and rose again, and is now in the business of setting every last one of us free, making us citizens of his empire and adopting us into his new family. He says to you today, here, here are my mother and my sisters and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my mother and my sister and my brother. Amen. Let us pray.